Welcome, everyone, back to the School of Greatness podcast. We've got the CEO and founder of CrossFit in the house, Greg Glassman. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you, Lewis. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks and, for um, having me. I want to share a story about how I got into CrossFit and heard about it for the first time. All right. I, was, I used to play professional football, arena football. And as I was uh, getting out of the sport, I, I got injured. I broke my wrist. And I was trying to figure out how to get back in shape. I gained about 30 pounds. And my college football teammate, Graham Holmberg, was a trainer at the time in Columbus, Ohio, and started working me out and doing these different type of workouts that I'd never really done before. And then he told me one day, I'm going to go do this competition thing. Uh, you know, I did it last year, and I got, like, top 20 in the country for this, like, obscure thing. And I'm going to go back, like, next couple weeks, and my goal is to get top five. And now a month or two goes by, and I see Graham afterwards, and I'm like, you know, dude, what happened with that competition thing that I had no clue what it was? And he goes, oh, I actually won. And I was like, what? What do you mean you won? And that's when I really started to learn about CrossFit was diving in to see, like, how my, my buddy, like, did with this event. And yeah. um, such a cool experience to really dive in and ended up being, you know, a huge CrossFit fan and going to the games to watch multiple times. Yeah. It's been an amazing journey to see what you've built and to see how many human beings have been have benefited from your brain, you know, your your creation. So, congrats on everything. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. It's a, and just just to be clear, um you know, I I'll take I'll take credit for the genesis, you know, the spark. But uh this is a largely been a spontaneously developing community. Yes. The uh the uh CrossFit Journal, which was fundamentally a newsletter that I soloed for for the first two, three years, you know, wrote every article. It was like starting a magazine and writing every article, which I wouldn't recommend anyone to ever do. <laughs> um, but that was that was a client's idea. And the, the first affiliate, the second CrossFit gym, the first affiliate, uh, was the idea of the of uh, Dave Warner that, you know, and Rob Wolf that called and asked to do it and mm. um, our, our best ideas have largely been other people's ideas um, demanded by the by the community sure sure and so staff and i are are uh, more the stewards of a of a natural resource than we are the architects of a mm. you know nobody nobody could have um, foreseen this and designed it and built it not not me nor anyone else. So would you say you're really good at listening to what the uh, the audience wants and you build something around that need? <laughs> um, I don't know how good I am. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I define a good idea as something that has an inevitable nature to it, you know, and what usually lacks is a champion and energy resources, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there's some things that people say, you should, you know, the games, you should have masters and, and kids. Of course we should. But, you know, every idea has a, has a price tag. Yeah. And it's not, it's maybe not just dollars. It could be, it could be energy or, you know, and in fact, I'd put it in this order. The hard thing is to get the champion. Second hardest would be the time. You and mean then, champion the person leading the. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. A guy who's, who's goes to bed worried about it, wakes up worried about it. Cause you don't have the time to do I, 30 I new things. I'm championing all I can. Exactly. And, and, and crushed by it. Yeah. And we're that way about three, four levels, three or four layers of, mm. of really talented people. Um, up to their, you know, got one nostril above the waterline. Yeah. And so and then people tell us, you know what you should do? And, and sometimes it's just financial. Like the year the guy says, hey, it's crazy. We don't fly all the athletes out to the games first class. You know, I mean, it's the games, the games, the games is not a profitable property. Right. You know, it's a. Uh, is it break it? even or does it make some? It, or? I, I think it did this year. I think we broke even. <laughs> yeah. But I thought we did last year and it cost us $4 million. Oh you know, my gosh! Yeah, I'll, even with the sponsors and all the ticket sales and the TV rights, yeah, they're still yeah, yeah. And know this: it and the thing's driven by thousands of volunteers. I mean, right. this is really we owe a lot of people a lot, but uh, it's 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 not a business in any sense that I would recognize I'm, as a business. I'm doing my first big event this this week uh -huh. coming up, and we're in the hall, and I'm just like, what am I doing of this year of planning and all yeah. these volunteers? Yeah. So it's a very small scale compared to what you created, but hey, I understand on a small level. It, that's, it starts, and then it, and it takes off, and, yeah. and uh, sometimes the problems begin when when the success starts. Mm. You know, yeah. what are you going to do with this thing? But it's all it's all been wonderful. I don't have complaints. Sure, but I do I do find it. Um, 
delightful when I see people uh, imitating the competition space and sure, with sure. visions of getting rich. Or what was it, the grid or something? And yeah. And these yeah, other yeah. Yeah, startups. Is I that even you, around anymore? Or I, is I, it? Yeah, something's going on. Sure. Something's going on. Um, the, uh, you know, of all the ways to get rich, starting a brand new sport is is like would really be low on my <laughs> list. Of, of exactly. Smart ways to yeah, it's smart tough. ways to to sure. make money. Now, how many I guess athletes are doing CrossFit around the world right now? Can you calculate, or is there a way? Um, that, that's a that's a the million dollar question, and it's it's come up with a handful of really kind of cool partners. You know, like we've had a long term kind of interesting. Uh, exploratory relationship with Microsoft they wanted to know our friends at YouTube and, and Google right. have been interested and in, uh, we were always interested ourselves too and of course media always asks how many CrossFitters are there mm -hmm. the problem starts in defining a CrossFitter yeah so I got a guy that's doing CrossFit like workouts but says he doesn't do CrossFit mm -hmm. so what do you do and it's well and then you hear it and it's you know it, it reminds me of the the gym where you see the rings and the rower and the kettlebells and the and the barbells and the ropes and and pull up bars and like we don't do CrossFit. And I was like, oh, really? What do you? What do you, do? <laughs> you know, what do you? Show me what you do with this stuff. I'd like yeah. to see it because if it didn't look like what we did, you'd have to like do maybe the same thing every day, or you'd have a schedule. Mondays we do this, Tuesdays uh -huh. that, or maybe the pace is so slow that there's not a cardio respiratory. It's not timed or yeah. Yeah, but I if it they just don't want to call it CrossFit, so it's not. They don't CrossFit. Want to pay the fee. <laughs> That's <laughs> fine. Yeah, sure. They don't want to pay and, the fee. And I'm I'm totally cool with that. You know, I never thought this was protectable. You know. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's like a blueberry muffin recipe, not a piece of software. Yeah, you can't. Unfortunately, you can't. You can't patent doing uh, can't kettlebell swings, it. right? Nope. <laughs> nope. And and maybe that's. But that's, you can protect the brand. We can protect the brand. We can protect the brand. Yeah. And the namings of workouts, I'm assuming, or something like that, yep. right? Or, yep. Yep. That's cool. That's very yeah. cool. Well, I guess how many registered so, members of gyms, maybe, or well, you know, the, you know that, uh, or? but the, the, we talk about those in the wild. That's the yeah. CrossFitters that aren't in the boxes. Right, and what is that number? But let me just answer your question sure. and tell you that, that, that we also do not know. I don't. I would. I don't believe if if so if if God had the answer, were willing to give it to me, I would be willing to sit here and bet a large amount of money that it's not less than two million. Mm. I would also bet with this same, you know, omniscient entity, the deity that's going to tell us how many there are, that it isn't over four. And cool. what's interesting, I mentioned our partners um, by by. Uh, they've come to the same numbers, but by some methods, just full of flaws. Hmm. But I, so I don't know. Maybe my method's not right. Here's what sure. we did. I took a stab at the <clears throat> at the financial ecosystem, and you know, I have a pretty good sense of how big we are, how big Rogue is, and you yes. know, all the players. And so you make make a list of of thirty businesses that are at the heart of this this movement. You know, mm -hmm. the movers and shakers. And uh, make an estimate of their size, and then and then f you have to figure out how many people are spending that much money. Yeah. And at two million, they're spending a boatload of money, wow. and at four million, um, significantly less. Sure. And so it gets to the point where I just don't think that people are spending that much money to create this much this much business. Mm -hmm. um, so less than two. But what's what's fascinating is that actually the so this is all very different than than the <clears throat> kind of Kim Kardashian social media mindset. The market value of of my audience is actually uh, more valuable with a smaller number because they're, they're spending more. Hmm. And so if you have if you ha if you could have a chance of dealing with with four million people spending four billion or two million spending four, you'd take the two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why? Um, less headache or something? Or no, it's no, it's a super affluent demographic. Uh, sure, you know, sure. uh, anyone anyone in business is proud to get the rich people. Yeah, of course. You know, yeah. yeah. And I, you know, accuse me of any kind of a uh, uh, rigorous economic uh, mindset, but uh, I'm kind of a trickle down guy. Um, you know, I believe that. You want to create a revolution, get the rich people on board, you know, and it comes up in a cultural revolution. I get, th I get them involved and it'll filter down. Yeah. You, you want, you're not going to get cars for poor people before rich people can have them. I'm right, not going right. to get, I'm not going to get people in homes with, mm -hmm. with no means if you can't do it for people with means. Yeah. And w what happens is that is, as that upper niche is, is satisfied, the natural 
tendency is to start moving into other markets. Mm-hmm. This is why, I mean, we just sat with, with <coughs> Google talking about their help and helping us reach a, a billion Indians. Wow. You know, and uh, that that's, and, and what's cool is that it's going to cost me a lot of money to do that and a lot of effort, but we're doing it because it's the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't have a sense that, that, that there's a market there for us, you know. I'll give you another example that's where we're going today, the congressional uh, 44th Congressional District here in California. Um, this includes um, Compton and Watts, Yeah, you know. It's a, it's a hard-hit area. There's a lot of underserved people, a lot of black people, a lot of brown people. There are 800,000 residents, and I only got 12 gyms there. Mm. And uh, it bothers me. And it, it's and the bother isn't – like, we got 14,000 gyms. I don't – I'm not looking at, the, the, at my black brothers and brown sisters and saying I'm not getting any of their money. It's not that. It's just that we have a we have a, a, a solution, an elegant solution, maybe an optimal solution to the world's most vexing problem. That's chronic disease, mm. and that community is hit harder than than any other. It's the it's the least healthy place in California, and I only got 12 gyms. Mm. Now globally, we've got. We've got one uh, nationally. We have a gym for every fifty thousand people. Okay, in the U.S. Yeah, in the U.S. And I've got a, I've got a, a globally that figures a hundred thousand. It's a hundred thousand folks teach wow. box. It's amazing. Um, I'm, I'm under the, I'm under the global standards that uh, in that, in that district. You know. Sure, sure. And 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 I and I'd like to and I'd like to reach them, and uh, but that's a that's kind of a luxury, given that we're here in the states. Where the average gym membership we understand from really reliable sources is five x the national gym average, wow. and so who's going to the boxes? Rich people, rich people. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of expensive. them don't. I mean, the, I I train at the Brick here, Brick yes. uh, CrossFit. Yeah. It's two hundred, two hundred fifty bucks a month. You know, yeah. it's not cheap. Yeah, you go to Gold's for thirty five a month. Exactly. You know, so these are high end gyms. They're high end gyms, yeah. and but I do have people of of. <clears throat> modest means that spend disproportionate of their income because they're that committed. So we got exactly. a lot of fanaticism yes. too. Exactly. But I would <clears throat> imagine a lot of gyms are doing what I did and that I had I had several billionaire clients that made it easy for me to say no to anyone that just touched me. You know, I've never and and it's like I can say this now because I used to live in fear of it getting out. I used to tell people, I'm gonna put you on a scholarship and if you tell anyone, <laughs> you're gonna lose it. Right. Tell one soul. You know what? No one ever did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you want someone to keep a, a secret? Yeah. Put a put a paycheck on it. You yeah. Know? Exactly. Not pay them, but take from them if they if they tell. And no one ever never shared. But uh, I bet a I'll bet a quarter of the people in my gym were not paying. Hmm. Um, and it maybe another chunk were uh, were uh, their boss was paying. Right. You know, the billionaire <laughs> that, right. that was taking care of them. Sure. And uh, I was really grateful for the for the 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 support of the wealthy. Um, I had a, a friend and client, Sonia Khan, uh, loaned me fifty thousand dollars to expand my gym, mm. and I, I tried to pay it back. When she says, "No, no, you pay that back when you're rich." And I, I tried a couple of years ago again. She says, "You're not rich yet." <laughs> I don't think she's ever going to let me pay That's it back. That's hilarious. Yeah. And 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 what was I able to do with that? Everything, everything, work with kids and athletes and people in the community that, you know, people that I would identify out in the street had a profound need come yeah. into my box. You know, yeah. They don't have two dimes they can rub together. It's sure. okay. I got gotcha, you, you know. Yeah. And uh, I've got that same attitude on the global level now. So I'm interested in India. I'm interested in, 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 in Brazil and, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, I was just down there in Rio for the Olympics. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of cross. There's a lot of CrossFit fanatics down there too. I mean, it's starting it's a, to blow up there. It's a it's a great market for us. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. It's a great market. So when was the first um, first time you said, okay, this is CrossFit. This is a thing. This is the gym. Was it a a moment? Was it a over time type of thing? Yeah, I I knew I knew in my uh, as a teenager that what was going on in the commercial gym facility was ridiculous. But yeah. That's because I was a gymnast and. Uh, um, you know, the lateral raises and the curls and the yeah, leg yeah. extension and the reading the paper on the bike. It's not um, athletic movements. No, yeah. no. And and so many athletes, as you know, don't like going to the gym because the, the dry land training, you know, yes. the, the gym part, it, 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 was, it was 
it was not why you liked football. And right. that's not what I liked about gymnastics. Mm-hmm. Gymnastics didn't have that 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 problem. There wasn't a there wasn't a, a training dry land right, training right, effort right. outside of the sport itself. But um people don't appreciate I think in the public that the uh, gymnastics routine is a is a uh, max heart rate event. Um that is ex- extremely demanding yes. in, in, in the cardiorespiratory sense, but you can't show it. You can't pant. You can't open your mouth wide. You've got to be all smile. You've got to look them <laughs> right in the face and salute and walk <laughs> off. And then, you know, but inside you're dying. And, and, it, and, and when the season comes along, um, it's not as bad, but early in the season, it's devastating. It's Fran like. And that was the impetus for developing that routine. I was trying to elicit the cardiorespiratory demands of a gymnastics routine um, uh, without doing the movements. This is in my own garage mm-hmm. where a parallel bar routine or a ring routine right. w- was is an impossibility for a 16-year-old kid. Sure, sure. And I, I nailed it. Um, th- I had a, one of those Voigt pull-up bars that you twisted into the uh-huh. doorway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had figured out if you took the rubber caps off. Uh-huh and just kept opening it, you could drive it into the jam and actually get something safe. Wow. The people I know that fractured their skulls, hurt their necks, or broke their arms swinging on these bars, trying to have a high bar at home, right? It's in your crazy. doorway, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> we used to do dismounts off those things. Wow. And every once in a while, I wanted to just come right off. Oh, my gosh. But I had a Voigt pull-up bar, and I had the Sears Ted Williams $19.95 110-pound weight set. And I just that very first day when it came out of the box, I was like, let's do 21 pull-ups and 21 of these things. Mm-hmm. And then 15 and 15, 9 and 9. And, and, and so that it feels extra shitty, which is what I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah. Let's use the clock and just do it as fast as I can. How old were you then? Uh, 16. Yeah. And, man, it worked. I threw up. Yeah. Threw up. Went across the street, got my buddy, brought him over, and he threw up. mm and we're like, that's it, because that's what happens. In the, see, in the season, when you early in the season, you're developing tricks. So you know things you want to be able to do in a routine. And as the season approaches, now i got to stitch them all together. And it, what a completely different thing that is, mm. to stitch them together than to do them in solo, to do them one after another in transition at max heart rate as opposed to coming up fresh, doing it, and getting off. Mm-hmm. Completely different world. Right. And, and uh, you couldn't be dialed into that process and buy into something like there are exercises that are cardio and others that aren't like i mean if your heart rate is high it's cardio isn't it sure you know and so in the fitness world it was it was bike run swim were the three cardios and then everything else was strength training and i'm like yeah but you do these thrusters with 95 pounds in these pull-ups, and you're going to get a whole lot stronger. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's cardio. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And what the, the exercise community's response to notions like that was that, that that blended adaptation was an impossibility. Well, they had it wrong. The experts were dead wrong. Mm. The segmented training develops a segmented capacity. So if you work strength Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and you work cardio on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, if I get my hands on you, I can set up a little circuit of of a, a cardio stimulus for which you have low regard and a strength uh, stimulus for which you have low regard and and uh, ask for f- three to five rounds of this and you'll find that you're not strong enough and you don't have enough wind. Mm-hmm. And that it's almost as if you had done no strength training and had never had any kind of cardio stimulus. Right. The blended, the blended demands, the out of the blended stimulus is a, is a unique beast. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's why? I mean, you've created the, people call it a cult or you know a tribe or whatever you want to call it. Do you think that these movements or the type of workouts that people are going through is what's created that, or do you think it's more of the culture, or is it the more of the people, is it more of the brand? I, I don't, I don't think we can separate them, but I will say the, the brand symbolizes the net effect and was and was. You know, the charm and allure of the brand didn't draw people in. Um, didn't draw people in. No, and, and I don't think it, it does still really. Right, right. What draws people in is the is the young lady or the young man or the that grandma or grandpa that's gotten results and mm. won't shut up about CrossFit. Right. And that's the that's where the marketing happens. And those people drag people in. They bring yeah. them by the arm. They bring them by the ear. You know, they beg them. Um, they're relentless in their pursuit of the next customer. Mm. 
and uh, that's that's there's a lot of magic there. It's almost like a gym doesn't have to do any marketing. Just get ten people in there, and it'll build on its own. You know, there's a there's a we've we've regularly had to define some terms. It, it often happens when a term that everyone uses. You have to ask, do we all mean something different when we say it? And some things like that, fitness. Everyone's got a different mindset, and we all use it. Um, yeah. uh, marketing was one of those things. But for me, marketing is any effort that is designed to improve the bottom line, mm-hmm. effective or not, but that's the hope. It's going to improve the bottom line. And it isn't a direct uh, tinkering of the product or service. So you're not improving the product or service. You found another way to get people in the door. Um, I, I'm I'm not really impressed with that, but mm-hmm. it, there is a level at which it happens, and it's essential, and it is that testimony of the end user. Yes, that person is marketing. They're not improving the product or service, but they're sure the hell out there now. And advertising would be that way, um, putting uh, uh, hot pink flyers under the windshield wipers at the cars at the malls, mm-hmm. Groupon, all those things are, are marketing efforts. A lot of advertising is is of that kind of thing. My advice would be to engage in none of that and anything like that. And for that's just me. That's my bias. Mm-hmm. And if you got any energy, resources, time, money, you know, talents, whatever, throw that back into improving your product or service. Get yeah. back to that. Back to that. That relationship with the person coming through the door. Do such a good job with them. That they go home and become one of those annoying people that won't shut them right, up right, about, right. about right, right. CrossFit. Yeah, and and I think that's happening everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, we've seen a few gyms uh, lose it all to Groupon. Just you know, they get a whole bunch of people that that uh, that uh, chase out the the people paying full price. Yeah. They don't stick around, and you're not making any money. But it's actually been the death of a of a couple of boxes. Sure, I would sure. Never never do anything like that. Sure. And so I, I, I never had to do any of that. But, you know, where was I? I was 100% in the presence with the client, you know, whether it was one, five, or ten of them. Mm-hmm. They were everything to me. And nothing else mattered. And they took care of me. I didn't have to ever ask anyone to come into the gym. Right. Ever. Right. They would spread the word. They were bringing yeah. people. If you were going to give them your full attention and energy during that hour session, they were going to go tell people afterwards. Of course. I just had the best workout of my life. You yeah. should come in. Look yeah. at the transformation. I feel amazing. And uh, Lewis says, so I talk to orthodontists and lawyers and accountants, and same with them. Yeah. Same thing. <clears throat> exactly. Like, no one no one advertised. You know, and there's always that Jacoby and Myers kind of sure, sh- sure. thing, you know, that's a little off the beat, or, you know, the dentist with billboards on every corner. And I think we all, a lot of us would be – wise to be suspicious of that mm-hmm. <clears throat> you sure, know sure. i'm not Absolutely. I, I have a i have a problem with a lawyer's got a, a commercial on every channel <laughs> yeah, three exactly. times a day yeah. you know i don't think that's the lawyer i'd, I'd be looking for necessarily right, right, right yeah but uh the consummate professional has great uh relationships with mm-hmm. the with the people they serve and they provide they're the source of the new people yeah, exactly great testimonials as well uh, yeah if someone was looking to build a movement, whether it be in the fitness world or any world, any industry, what would you say are the key ingredients that they would need based on what you've done, um, I guess, to replicate it, you know, a CrossFit in their industry? Some of the answer might come in the, in the, 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 what I see business as today, you know, my definition of business. And we got some pretty good traction with this at Harvard Business School and mm-hmm. two appearances. And yeah. Got, it, it, it was really appealing to the students, and, and uh, so that really appealed to me too. Because right. I, I think if it, I'm not sure um, if the definition is anything other than my own bias, and then to find that kids at the Harvard MBA program really liked it, so I go, okay, maybe it is more than just you know my take on things. But I believe the business is is the art and science of creating uniquely attractive opportunities for other people, and anyone that can iteratively sustainably over you know five years or more create an opportunity of any sort whether it's a product or service that is uniquely attractive and what the evidence of that is that they buy it they avail it sounds like right. but if you can if you can provide a uniquely attractive opportunity um for other people uh, you're going to have a successful organization or a successful business and for me a business is a is is an organization um and importantly so um, money is to a business like uh, uh, 
jet fuel is to an airline. The goal of the airline is to get people from A to B safely, um, comfortably, mm -hmm. right, and 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 uh, uh, cost effectively, right. So for them and you, and if you're successful to the extent you're successful, you're going to find that you're going to be burning more gas, right. But for anyone to look and say, well, the goal here is to burn gas, um, you're mixing, you're confusing the dependent variable for the independent variable, and it it, it, it doesn't work at all. And I so all those people that think that money's about making business <coughs> about making money, um, that's not the kind of business I'm interested in. And it may be the that maybe that kind of hmm. money is a different kind of organization and it might somewhat be kind of an east coast, west coast thing. And I say that because hmm. I talk about business not being about making money and people point some Goldman Sachs asshole out <laughs> or a whole bunch of them in or out of the current administration or and the past one. But uh uh, that that's that's not what's going on in Silicon Valley. Yeah, not really. And I and I can say that because I've had some uh, uh, super successful you know household name clients from from the Silicon Valley. And uh, to think that they were that they got where they were because they were trying to get rich would be a profound uh, misunderstanding. Right. What were they trying to do? Um, in the case of one, you know, and it's not that it's more noble than making money, but I got a buddy that if. If he can write code that works better than yours, he's smarter and better than you. And he just like, that gets him off. Right. Well, you find success for that in San Jose, and it's going to rain money. Sure. But it isn't about the money. It really isn't about the money. And because he, he, he'd do it for free, and he it's, did and it's does. It's craft. Yeah. Yeah, he can't, he can't help but do it. Yeah. If you put him, if you took all his stuff away, two ways away, and locked him in a cell somewhere, he'd do that still. He'd still be writing, mm -hmm. you know writing code it's just yeah. he's one of those guys right right and uh and that's that's kind of refreshing really it was for me mm -hmm. it was for me what it meant is because you know i do this i do this thing where i make an x and then show you are here right and then i got a dollar sign up here and over here i have an e for excellence and i say from from here it, people just i want money and what you know the universe doesn't care if you want money mm -hmm. nobody cares that you want money and and markets are somewhat unknowable, and and you you go to chase the money, and you miss the mark. A lot of people end up behind bars, lost, broke, just trying to get rich. Um, and and but if you pursue excellence, um, it's it's like a beacon, it's a lighthouse. You know, that's you can see it. There's there's easy agreement and easy recognition of something outstanding. Uh, I. I don't know anything about orthodontic practices other than I had an orthodontist as a kid. Well, I got a buddy in Prescott, Arizona that has an orthodontic practice. And you go in there and it's just, it's visually amazing, mm -hmm. right? He's got, you know, 15 chairs with this view of the mountains wow. and, a, and a pretty girl at each one right. doing the work and music's going and it's well appointed and it's a factory, you know? Sure. And he's standing there with his arms folded and a big <coughs> smile on his face and it's just really cool. And the spirit in there is neat. And I go, holy cow, doc, this is amazing. You know, I mean, he's just, he's doing orthodontia brilliantly. Yeah. I've seen in hair salons and restaurants. And the same thing, you go to a place and, you know, there's it's dirty and you can just, you can just, right. you'll know right away. Feel the energy, yeah. Yeah. And, and so the excellence, excellence shines bright and it's obvious to everyone. It's such an, it's so, it's so non-elusive and you can every day work towards that E, towards that excellence. Mm -hmm. And you know <clears throat> that you're, that you're, you're uh, in, you're making steps progress towards it you can metric it you feel yeah. it you know when it's you're making it better and what do you do tomorrow i'm gonna make it better and how about the next day i'm gonna make it even better exactly. and you keep looking for things to make it better and you, there's nothing like that on the money so here's what happens those that will stay committed and 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 really want the e not the cash they get there now here's what markets do the markets move the money to the excellence and mm. almost always by a path that you wouldn't have figured out and so the other big part of the Silicon Valley story is the guy trying to get from here to there. And and uh, along the way, um, the target shifts a little. And it's uh, it's excellent, but not that excellent, but this one. Uh -huh. And then here comes money from a different angle. But the right. people that have repurposed startups with large number of employees and just abandoned the technology, like pick a new one quick because you got to do something, right? We got, yes. you know, I have a buddy of mine had a uh, – technology that he thought was the sure thing and a deal with sprint and 
um, turned out that they had been uh, given the the business to throw off from the other cell phone people the fact that they knew this technology was dead. Hmm. And they just made the investment to, and anyways, so my buddy was kind of a pawn in a in a in a game of misleading AT and T and right, Verizon, right. and so he had to come up with something because th- what they wanted to do can't be done, and sure, they thought sure. it could. And the people that hired him to do it knew it couldn't be done too, um, and so they had to come up with something brand new overnight and did, and just to save everyone's jobs and the business. Wow. And but it's cool. Wow. So cool. Do you feel like you've made any uh, big mistakes that you wish you could take back over the years in either building the brand or? How things have run with the business, or oh, I, it's got some smart ass answers. I've been so disappointed by the behavior out of the weightlifting community sometimes that I wish I hadn't salvaged their dying sport. But that's <laughs> I'm being I'm I'm being flippant there. Sure. Um, now, is there any regrets you've had in building the brand or the way you've run the games or boxes or anything? Um, I you know if I if I was starting over, I would devalue the kipping pull-up and let it occur naturally and those that you know the people that can't do strict pull-ups trying to kip is is wrong Mm. you know the kip comes in in ineluctable you 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 know you go from 20 pull-ups to 40 pull-ups to 60 pull-ups you're gonna kip you're gonna learn yeah and it's kind of a time under tension thing there's uh you the i can i can you can show me a videotape of of five of five pull-ups five of ten five of twenty or five of a hundred and i'll know which it is and if it's five of a hundred that first five they're really fast yeah right sure sure. and if it's five for five that's slow Mm -hmm. and the kip comes naturally as a whole body movement out of that whole thing and it's not a it's not a gymnastics move because it's not taught in gymnastics that's not the kip it's it's how gymnasts train pull-ups and gymnasts need to have a hundred pull ups. You're not gonna get a hundred pull ups unless you can kip. Mm. But it's but it's not used in anything. You know, it's just right. a, it's just a it's an artifact of training. Did, was that created? Who created the the kipping pull up? Or nobody. No it's one. uh it's what happens when you keep adding pull ups. Got gotcha. you. They have go to. faster and faster and faster. Yeah. Now the butterfly kip a little different. That was someone 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 got a little clever there. Mm-hmm. You know, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um. But uh. uh you know, it's just one example. I, yeah. I, Do you feel like you've structured the business in the way that you would wanted to, or if you could look back and you, how many boxes do you have now? Or fourteen thousand. Fourteen thousand. Yeah. And how is it? Does it continue to grow? Or have you seen a decline? Still, or? still, still growing. There's some markets leveling off, and others mm-hmm. exploding. China's huge. Brazil's yeah. huge. You know, um, in the D.C. where we have the greatest density in the United States, it's it's tapered. Mm-hmm. Um, some fall off others yeah. just keep growing bigger yeah you know the the best of them will will continue to expand continue to grow it seems mm-hmm. there's you know there's people talking about i think with any new gym or any new fitness thing that it's a fad or at some point it will have its time or at some point it will be whatever do you have that fear with crossfit that none 10 20 30 none. years like it's going to start to taper or here's 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 what threatens us in that respect um, the community is driven by the the wonders of of the entrepreneur and, and capitalism and the mm-hmm. free market, individually owned and operated. That's a miracle. That's a pillar. Mm-hmm. The other piece is that the stimulus of um, constantly varied high intensity functional movement, leveraged against a diet of meat and vegetables, nuts and seeds, some fruit, little starch, no sugar, is a really really good match for the needs of the species um and and a billion years of evolution mm-hmm. you yeah, know yeah. with the uh right. th- there's there's things that we're doing that are at the heart of all mammalian species so it's, you know go back a billion years sure, sure. and i'll just give you one of those would be uh, uh respect for the insulin glucagon axis um the first sh- proto shrew had a pancreas and so do we right the abuse of that pancreas is a modern thing, um, and we can blame the CDC and the NIH for that, amongst others. And and it, down at our level, at the grunt level, the NSCA and the ACSM, still promoting deadly diets, by the way. Yeah. And so CrossFit is the fad that brought a stimulus back to the shrew mm. a billion years ago. It's that kind of fad. Yeah. 
Now, um, the non-CrossFit stuff was the fad. And I knew that. What do you mean? I, well, the uh, lateral raises and curls. The We're going to do cardio distinct from strength training. Um, we're going to be on machines with pins. Mm-hmm. Um, you can deadlift if you want to be a big, ugly, power, fat power lifter. And you run if you want to be have cardio. Mm-hmm. And But nobody should ever do both. And certainly not in the same workout ever. Right. And I knew that was horse shit. Yeah. Just obvious crap. And mm. and you, but you couldn't you couldn't be an athlete and not know that, mm-hmm. not know that. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, you know. And imagine imagine the notion of nobody needs to be strong at high heart rate. Like, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, you, right. you don't have to be. You don't have to have a big imagination to see what's wrong with that, mm-hmm. right? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The the challenge is, you know. I know you. I've heard some interviews where people ask you this question about injuries, and as a competitor myself, it's really hard to taper back and hold back in the gym. Yeah, it's hard to not compete against my own time, not compete against everyone else at the same time. Yeah, and if I don't have the self awareness of how my body's feeling, you know, I've tweaked my back many times. I've gotten little injuries here and there from yep. CrossFit, yep. and. You know, I'm responsible for it because I'm the one who pushes the, the boundaries. How let, do you, let how me do you share do? something with you. Yeah. You can do everything absolutely perfect. You're still going to get hurt. Yeah. Um, I can tell you this too. You're going to be much more injured um, by driving the workout injury to zero. And mm-hmm. what will happen is now comes the specter of chronic disease. Yeah. Look, um, a couple of million people are going to die this year from chronic disease. And uh, what is the figure? I think it's 2.8 million. Might be making that up. <laughs> but it's, a, it's a lot. Sure. I do know this, that 70% of the population will die from chronic disease. Mm. It has the, the, the two-headed hydra of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a cause in sedentarism, holding still, and mm-hmm. malnutrition, yeah. the crappy diet. And the worst of that would be the eating way too much of everything, but in every case, it involves too much carbohydrate, specifically high glycemic carbohydrate, specifically sugar. And that lifestyle is the deadliest thing on the planet. It takes 70% of lives, and we're exporting it now so that this number is, is holding true, even in places that are ravaged by infectious disease. They're rapidly approaching a 70% rate on chronic disease. Wow. And so, and so, you know, the number of people that die from chronic disease is twice the number that die from all other causes combined. Mm. And that's what happens when you watch TV and eat the way the Center for Disease Control wants you to eat. Right. And so, and so as soon as you get off the couch, it's dangerous. Yeah. And <laughs> it is because, you know what, I'm going to tell you that sitting there watching TV – um, is it, there's a much less chance of acute injury, like say picket, ACL tear, right. uh, break a wrist. I don't care any any of these sprains and strains, you know, bruises, bumps, even you know things that might require surgical repair. As soon as you get up off the couch, those those numbers insert themselves. Mm. So you say, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the gym, and so you you get in your car, well the wrist just got compounded. You still have the risk of being sedentary. Yeah. And but now you're out in, in public. Ride your bike to the gym, and it and it, it, it the risks are even greater. Hmm. Just look at it, look in this beautiful city here of L.A. I was doing the stats once. I pulled down some LADPD reports of car versus bicycle. It's horrifying. Every few minutes, someone gets whacked on a bike mm. to where an ambulance is needed. Every couple of minutes, every day in the city. And so that's some really dangerous shit, right? Right. And then once, you, but once you get into the gym, I've still all those risks go up. But what has, what is in free fall now is the risk of chronic disease. And so we trade we trade the sprains and strains to avoid the heart attacks, the strokes, the cancers, right. the diabetes, and to and so someone says, you know, I got a buddy that got hurt doing CrossFit. You know, isn't it dangerous? Like, <laughs> You know, it's dangerous sitting on your couch all day. Yeah, <laughs> two million buddies died not doing CrossFit. Right, right. And in chronic disease is <laughs> it, it fundamentally is a lack of CrossFit in your life. Mm-hmm. You know, so you don't like functional the, movement. You don't like yeah. right, right, yeah, yeah. right. You, moving, functional, functional movement, movement yes. functional movement. You need to be. You need to be able to pick things up off the ground. Get yes. your ass out of the chair. You know, those are 
Those aren't exercises. Nobody invented the deadlift. Nobody invented the clean. Nobody invented the pull-up. Whoever says, hey, check this out. Can you believe this looks like check that out? I made that up, you know? No, you didn't, dude. We've been everyone's been standing up for a long time. Right. You're full of shit. <laughs> but 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 someone says they invented the the you know, somewhere someone invented the lateral race. Because there's someone that was holding something doing this. The guy says, What the hell are you doing? He goes, It's an exercise. It wasn't it was it wasn't it wasn't you know, the, the functional movements, it's obvious what you're doing the value. Yes. You know, the the uh, hyenas are chasing you. Jump in a tree. You don't. You yes. didn't. You didn't invent the pull you, up. You pull up and yeah, right. You're getting that. away. You yeah, know, yeah. and throwing a rock. You know, that's not. No one invented that. It's mm -hmm. been. It's been there since time immemorial. It's built in, baked into who and what yeah. we are. Yeah. And it, it, the the first exercise physiologist, I can't remember his name. When you look him up, when I'm talking, he was a guy, a Brit that that observed that the. Uh, uh, Ticket takers on the double decker buses mm -hmm. um, had a fraction of the heart attack rate that the drivers did, <laughs> and they were making the same pay, and you'd get get the job, and they just assign you to one or the other. But one of them was dying in in large numbers, and the other wasn't. And uh, um, in his 99th year, this this genius observed that this is the first time in history where people have to deliberately exercise to find health. That you know, and so. The subject is the fad. Um, yeah, CrossFit's CrossFit's a a, a fad, right. um, just in the way that your your the human genome is a fad, mm -hmm. um, and it's and it's 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 as, it's as stable as that genome is, which is pretty damn stable. And so people would say to me, "You still like the zone diet?" <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, I do." And they go, "Wow, it's been a long time." And <laughs> yeah, well, you know, balance of the insulin glucagon axes, adequate essential fatty acid intake. I mean, these things, these things go back a ways. Yeah. Yeah. Would the zone diet have worked on people in pre-Columbian time? Of course it would. Mm. You know, sure. of course it would. Sure. These the Sears and Glassman and a bunch of others, we've designed for our for our perception of the physiological need that was the goal mm -hmm. it wasn't to make money <clears throat> it wasn't to sell a book it wasn't to uh uh you know we were we, we were addressing a a, a, a a riddle you know a yeah. scientific question mm -hmm. and something like that is very very much not likely to be a fad now may people not uh crossfit in the future well, sure, but I don't. That wouldn't make it a fad to me either. You yeah, know, sure, there, sure. A lot of a lot of good things have been lost. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I'm doing a I'm doing some research about masculinity for a new book that I'm writing. Now, that's interesting. It's, it's the book's called The Mask of Masculinity. I've been interviewing former professional athletes to female psychologists to men, women, everyone, and um, I'm curious to hear your opinion about how CrossFit has either shaped or reinvented or evolved masculinity or what type of energy you see in a gym around both men and women coming together, doing these type of primal workouts to the max every day. Does that evolve someone's, uh, I guess, masculinity? Does it make them more loving and vulnerable? Does it make them harder? Does it make them able to connect with the individuals because there is community What's your thoughts? I'm grinning here because my focus has been the women, because um, there's something, you know, if you if you kind of rephrase the whole thing around around the ladies and is you sure. know what's going on there, I, yeah. I, and I and I will come to that because now I get to, yeah you, I love to hear kind of went there, and the guy thing I haven't thought about so much I haven't seen it but I but I I can offer a few things. Um, I think this is the maybe the vainest population to ever walk the earth, <laughs> and and I and I but I don't yes. I don't see it as a bad thing. Everyone's shirtless. Everyone's yeah, taking yeah. photos. Shirtless. But you know what? Yeah. They, they look so fucking good. They, they maybe do. ought to. I mean, it's like <laughs> I, I get it. They you look know? good naked. You yeah, know? <laughs> yeah. Um, it, so it's maybe it's not a false vanity. You uh -huh. know, they they look really great and they know it and they're proud of it. And so, ah, that's all cool. <laughs> but there's but there's an enormous amount of testosterone. Yeah. And no fights. Hmm. Never hmm. had a fight at a CrossFit event. It's a lot of brotherly love. I sense. It's crazy because I I would know. think you can't you can't even do that you can't do that in the Marine Corps. Hmm. You know you can't do it in a football team. Right. You know it's it's we the CrossFitters don't fight. They don't, there's none of that going on. Um, we've never had a secure. Uh, you know we've had we've had 
people show up that weren't supposed to be at an event kind of security event, but there's no one there's no one that Breaking had too much to drink and yeah. um police manage large venue events by getting hourly reports on the gate and the alcohol consumption. I don't know if you know that or mm-hmm. not, but when you, if you have a stadium there's a there's a guy running the thing who will every hour um it was our Andy Rios at one that he's getting he knows how many beers have been poured. Yes. You know, and sure, sure. when more beers come in and they they have the right to cut it off, and they've got some magic numbers where um, right. you you work beyond so many people and so many beers and so much time, and that's when the violence starts. Yeah. And so they trim back the beer, and and uh, CrossFit we run we run a, a pretty drunken event <laughs> because there's it, uh, none of those rules apply, right? And so the beer just flows all day long, and we don't <laughs> have people throwing up on each other or fist fighting or stealing stuff. Um, Every year at the games, someone loses something, and I always tell uh, the I've told the security people I want to know when someone's misplaced a, a wall of a person. If it's if there's any way for me to come by them, I want to go because I want to be there and look them in the eyes. I want to tell them you're going to get your wall and purse back. Right, someone's going to be honest. Yeah. And, and and what's typically done at StubHub Center is if you want, you can start checking the trash cans, and you, hopefully they'll take in the cash and throw in your mm-hmm. picture, of your kids, and that kind of stuff in the garbage. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's no need to do that here. Someone is gonna is gonna turn it in, and it's gonna get back to you, and it'll be by, but sometime at the end of the day, maybe into the evening. But sure. you're gonna get it. And I was telling a reporter that, along with our uh, our agent uh, from uh, William Morris, uh, Gabby Morgerman, um, I was telling her the story, and it wasn't a half hour later that where's my purse, <laughs> and uh, and an hour later, um, her assistant calls her and says. Some guy has found your bag. He went through everything in it, and he found my phone number on an envelope oh my gosh. and called, and he's waiting for you, and this guy's standing there with her purse. <laughs> She'd left it outside, you know? And, like, of course, that's what happens. I, and I think I can tell you the why of it, too. And I don't even know how this to do with masculinity, but it, but it, 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 it's, it's related to testosterone in men and, and the things men do and <laughs> when they get them in large numbers, and we don't do those things. Why? Why? Um, uh, CrossFit's really, really hard, and a lot of shitty behaviors come out of people looking for shortcuts for the easy way. And the CrossFitters, we both select for and train that all good things come out of sacrifice, commitment, hard work, not finding a purse. <laughs> you know, that shortcut. Not, it, yeah, yeah, shortcut stealing. Yeah. You know, and so and so that 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 bring that brings a layer of decency on the on the whole thing. Mm-hmm. But. Uh, I think there's enough confidence in who you are physically that uh, that uh, hmm. that makes that. You know, I wrote an article years ago. I think it might have been published in a, in the Santa Cruz paper or some paper, but it was published somewhere. And I, I was saying that the uh, martial arts community, in terms of its physical training, there. Uh, you know, this is the MMA was just starting. The Gracies were coming around, and all I'm watching the UFC. And early days, loved it. It, it was great. Still, an amazing property. But I said these guys are are training on two of eight cylinders. That it's just the the their their fitness is woefully lacking. And you try athletes just in case you think that you know that just as bad if not worse. Mm. And I got a I got a crazy response from it. I got um, hate, death threats, death threats from the triathlon community, death threats, phone numbers, threatening to kill, rape, murder my wife, disguised voices emails with the craziest stuff and the martial arts community what happened is some of the many of the world's best martial artists came to me and said sir would you please help me with my training i'd love to see what it is you have to offer now what makes what makes a skinny little twerp <laughs> in a speedo with a number on his arm think he's gonna kick my ass and where the guy at the market was it's it's a confidence mm. you know and they're just they're just beyond that beyond it the martial arts community has just been a joy to work mm. with. Just a yeah. joy. Really like those kids, mm. all of them. Less ego, less ego in a let you less ego in a UFC competitor than a tennis player. Mm. You know, and I in don't, general, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah except for fair, a couple, yeah. throw them all under the rug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, you know, in the UFC, you, you don't get a paycheck unless you talk a load of shit. Yeah, and they get uh, trained. Then you get a big, t- then you get a big paycheck. Yep, yeah. and you can get a check bigger than your talents if yeah. your mouth's big enough. Exactly. So I like, and so they got to do that. I was close to BJ when they made him talk a lot of crap, and he's not a crap talker. Yeah, he's got he's got none of that. It's in like him. a reality show. None of that. Yeah, in yeah. Him. yeah. And so that there was a lot of that. 
you know, that's the uh, P.T. Barnum kind of mm-hmm. angle mm-hmm. that the fight world has going with it. Uh, I mean, how does uh, having women and men then both in the gym with with women, how has this been affected with masculinity with women? Yeah, um, the Because uh, uh, you were grinning before about saying yeah, something. Yeah. Um, The old style of PT where, you know, there were movements we did, the snatch, uh, muscle up. There were, there were the powers that be in the fitness industry rejected those things. And, and even in the military community initially, that these were too complicated, that you'd get hurt. It was a, basically was unknown. Mm-hmm. But, but ultimately, without them even knowing it, what they were bristling at is that there was a neurological component. It required coordination. It required accuracy. It required agility, and it required balance. And that's not macho stuff. It's the stuff of gymnastics. But it is well within the province of of a lot of what women do and the way they they are. And that stuff came very naturally to them for a couple of reasons. Um, one is they don't have the contractile potential. They're just not as strong, and so they have to be effective. Um, the other thing is that a, a gal has no problem going, I don't know how to do that. Would you show me? Mm. And a guy comes in and goes, I know how to do that. I do it all the time when he's never done it at all. You know, I used to watch at Gold's. <laughs> I'd watch a guy try a 400-pound deadlift and miss and then come up and say, yeah, I got 450 today. <laughs> and like, oh, dude, we were all watching. You failed at four. You know, we were right here watching. Um, so the guys will lie about what they do. And a, and a a chick would stand there and you know curling and go I-, I can't do this it's too heavy and like so the women are their egos are such that they didn't have full appreciation of their capacity and the guys had this ego that actually had to, i think some of those guys that came up and said they did 450 when it was four didn't know they were lying hmm. and so our sense of self is so inflated compared to theirs that it makes them easier to train and it makes it easier for them to learn some of this stuff you know you can see a guy seething being <laughs> taught something he doesn't know how to do some of them why is that macho idiots you know just mm. masculinity i don't know yeah. you know ego but uh uh do you feel like people are retrained through crossfit and they evolve then or is I, it maybe or we're selecting i don't know right. but it, i tell you what you know we um uh there are some super athletes in this community that uh started off as uh as uh bodybuilders and their first exposure was was a tough thing for them emotionally, intellectually, mm-hmm. physically. They couldn't you know? do it the way they wanted to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was it just really, just, you know, really stressful. Um, I, did, was, was, I don't want I don't want to get his name wrong. He's a good dude. And I feel bad, but there was a was a great example of that. There was someone that uh, mm. might come back to it. But sure. so so the modern PT prior to CrossFit had removed all of that coordination actually agility and balance so there's no cleaning there's no snatching there's no handstands we're not hand walking what are we doing well it's it's uh you know uh jumping jack sit up run you know <laughs> lather rinse repeat kind of thing mm-hmm. um it was it was dumbed down yeah. you know, what i call dumbed down pt where you move the neurological elements that radically exaggerates the difference in physical capacities between men and women Mm. and dumb down PT. Um, One advantage we have physically over women is pretty significant is contractile potential. You know, just how, with what force can the muscle shorten? Guys are a lot better than that at girls. Um, When you add a neurological component to it and you make it in, in, so the CrossFit definition of strength is not just contractile potential, but it's productive application of force. And if the goal becomes to get above the rings is your productive application of force or to uh, stay balanced under an overhead squat is your productive application of force, um, the, differences, the differences shrink significantly. Mm-hmm. And so we stacked the deck against the ladies when we, when we went to the, to the uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, cardio, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, uh, doing lateral raises and curls and leg mm-hmm. extensions. And you bring it into the CrossFit space, and all of a sudden what we have is the 110-pound gal mentoring the kid that played football and just can't seem to get the overhead squat right. 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 And we used to make show of that with Nicole versus the, the big guy yeah. in the certs. I don't know if you've sure. seen any of that. Sure, yeah. And it was a, a 95-pound load and 50 overhead squats. And what I'd do is look for the buffest, biggest <laughs> dude in the gym who's 
whose overhead was kind of like this. So he's 15 <laughs> degrees forward, and you put yeah. your hands where they are, put them overhead, and then, and then here's how he gets them overhead, leans back right, until right. the arms are straight, but I still don't have an open shoulder. And so will that beast, and I don't care if he's got a 500-pound bench press, what's going to happen at, at 95-pound overhead squat mm-hmm. and 50 reps? Nicole will get to 50. He, he will not. You just can't. Yeah. You can't. If that's where overhead is, you, you, you're sunk. Same for holding a handstand. And uh, um, so there, there, it's all been really empowering. Hmm. Add to that, and so I'm on the subject of the ladies now. Yes. You add to that our meat and vegetables, nuts and seeds, some fruit, little starch, no sugar. And a lot of the uh, uh, insanity around body image just disappears. It's gone, long gone. We don't have any eating disorder people. Mm. We got a lot of young ladies that have come from that that problem, but it's long gone now. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, does does jeans make my butt look fat? I mean, our girls know their butt looks good. <laughs> yeah. and, and and your opinion doesn't matter. And they're not afraid to out eat you at the table and brag right. about it. Right. And and their confidence, it's so beautiful. And in the end, what has happened is that we now have uh, there are enough of, of them, of us, um, that there, a, a new aesthetic has emerged. It's a it's a new look, a and new it's created and it's created a new aesthetic, and it's as strong a, as a new beautiful, right? Yeah, it's a functional aesthetic. Mm-hmm. It's a functional aesthetic, and it, it frees women of the tyranny of an arbitrary ath- aesthetic. And when it's arbitrary, look at what we've seen: um, uh, uh, stretched necks, elongated necks in Africa, uh, binding feet in Asia. Um, heroin anorexia chic in in the West. Right. And all of these things are debilitating, devastating, yeah. unhealthy, and supposed to be pretty. Mm. What they also ha- what they also do is reduce a woman's ability to to uh to uh resist you. And I find the whole thing disgusting. Mm. Disgusting. I think it I think it's I think it's a it's a cultural adoption of a of a rape culture, mm. and you know who, why, why do we have to impair our women for them to be beautiful? Sure, it bothers the hell out of me, and so I'm really, really proud of the CrossFit girls because mm. they say they um, they're strong and in every sense of the word, yeah, every yeah. sense there's it's just strength. It's it's wonderfully empowering. Do you think they lack vulnerability? No, no. Do you think the men that train in CrossFit consistently lack vulnerability or emotional? Mm. Um, I, maybe I don't know. Mm. Maybe I don't know. But I don't. Do I think they've trained themselves so much that they're unable to, you know, express themselves. Uh, really, does that happen? I, I've noticed there's a, a bit of a dry personality around the top games competitors. Mm. <laughs> Which <laughs> I want to get into. <laughs> sure. I, I've, I've I've been seated at the table before. Mm-hmm. With a table full of champions, and it's dry, huh? You know, man, you're hearing the clinking of forks. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do, What do you think? Uh, what do you think would happen if it was just? Have you noticed that? You know what I'm talking about? I think it's just they're just very serious. They're so focused, you know, and it's um, you know, they their whole life is. This. I don't know. The NFL's Maybe. full of focused guys, and they're going yeah. out at night committing felonies and yeah, having a blast. That's you true. know, I don't. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean, maybe there's more. Um, <laughs> you're more part of a team in football, so you're yeah. able to like joke and play and yeah. like play games on each other. But it's more of like obviously you, you train together and you have some partner stuff, but it's yeah. more lone wolf type of energy. I, I would think. just tell you, you know, you get put on the athlete bus <laughs> sure, on the way sure. somewhere, and you know, silence you, crickets. You might yeah. want to get on one of the other buses. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the volunteers you, are way more fun. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no stress on them. Well, I, some, I get. Yeah. I get that. They're focused, you know. I mean, we did, when you when you guys traveled in football, were you having a blast? We were having a blast. It was almost too crazy. Yeah, okay. Plus, That's my at, sense of it. Especially at arena football, it's like Bull Durham. It's yeah. like, dude, a bus a bus full of gymnasts is 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 like a it's like it's the it's the monkey bus, nuts. you know. Same thing with and they're players. coming it's out crazy. the windows and trying to get on top. And you don't even want to know the stories that happened it, with football players after the games in the bus it was it was nuts it was like almost like get me out of here you yeah, know it's a little crazy yeah, good that's what i was hoping it would be <laughs> like what um what do you think it would be like if it was just all men training and, and all women training do you think there'd be a dim- different dynamic or different energy um i uh in these boxes if it was yeah, just my, like men only or, men I, or women only I, the only exposure i have to a male only environment was 
as a youngster, I had a brief stint at the Hughes Aircraft Company because my father and mother and grandparents and uncles and aunts and everyone that knew worked had worked there, and so I'd get a, do a little job there, and uh, it was it was almost all male, and it was horrible. I mean, I couldn't stand mm, it. Yeah. I don't, but yeah, I would. I wouldn't. I wouldn't <clears throat> want that. Um, the women. The women have been uh, role models in our gyms. Yeah, role models. Someone. Asked, I always ask what you know. I love getting coached by a woman. Yeah, at the gym. Fun. I feel like it's they're. Fun. Yeah. Hey, let me let me share technique, this with you. Alignment. You know. I've had a dozen bosses in my life. I've always. I've always. Um, really enjoyed the the women that I worked for. They were. Um, fantastic bosses and check this out the better i did and the better i made them look the more they liked me hmm. and the and the and the more success we all enjoyed i've had male bosses that become increasingly uncomfortable with the quality of your work hmm. the better it gets a lot of them the more they don't like you interesting yeah and they're feel and threatened they're, or yeah sure they're more afraid of being outshined than being mm. made to look good yeah. Yeah, but you get a you get a you get a lady telling you to do a job and you do a, just a perfect job of it, it, you'll make her really happy. And there's guys that'll just like, oh mm. shit, uh oh, you funny. know, it That's is. Funny. Have you noticed it? Have you had it? I've never had a boss. You ever had? You ever seen that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How That's about funny. you? You? Yeah, yeah, no. Hope I've, that's okay to do. Hit the peanut gallery. Here. Yeah, of course, yeah. of course. A um, couple final questions for you. This has been fascinating. So thank you for opening up. Is there any question that you wish people would ask you that they never do that you could that you could answer? Yeah, and I can't think of what it is now, but I have thought about it before. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, if I, I'll, I'll come back to you <laughs> and send it to you too late. <laughs> but I, to I, 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 you know, I've, I've done that. Yeah. What's What's something then you're you're most proud of that people most people don't know about you? Oh, it, it, our impact on on the women in our community, just what we were on. That's mm -hmm. probably probably is that it's it's a it's a it's a current hot button for me. I'm just fascinated by it. I'm amazed too at how how much it's gone unnoticed. You know, I tried to communicate this to the people at Vogue, and then it ended up with that spread they did on Annie Thor's daughter. And mm -hmm. I think they were more tripping on her than fully appreciating that this was liberation from a, a devastating. Uh, deadly culture that they were kind of at the heart of mm -hmm. you know it might have been the might have been the wrong the wrong audience the wrong sure. the wrong magazine to make that point sure but uh uh and the other thing is look i'll just tell you where the current leadership is at at, at crossfit at hq and, and it relates to pride and things i'd like to be asked and wish the world knew um we have an elegant marked by simplicity and efficacy we have an elegant solution to the world's greatest problem and that's chronic disease and our team the hq team has 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 uh, recommitted we're doubling down to change the world's perception of what happens in the box and i explained to staff by the world i mean all those people that are never going to go to a gym and yeah. die from chronic disease i would <laughs> like them to know that there is that we have something in our boxes the people that are currently going to the gym I'd like them to know. The people that are going to the box, going to the CrossFit already, CrossFitters, they need to know. You're not just getting fit. Um, you're, you're, you're saving your life. And I need the people that train them to know it and the affiliates themselves to know it and those of us at HQ. So literally everyone in the world, I would like them to be increasingly aware of, of what it is that's happening in the box. And it's health. That's what's happening in the box. It's way more significant than the fitness. Yes. The fitness is a Trojan horse, mm -hmm. delivering wellness, delivering wellness. And, and uh, you know, sometimes you, you wish people knew and there's a little regret. No, we're, that, it's our job now to get that message out. Yeah. So I get to come places like this and share that with you because sure. I think it's really, really important. Sure. You know, you... It, 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 it's not good to save a life and not know you're doing it, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. You ought to know. Yeah. And you know what? We'll never see the heart attacks that don't happen. We won't see the Alzheimer's that doesn't develop. We're, you, you, only, you only see it when people get sick. But, but look, I got, I got, I got let's, let's go with the 4 million figure. Well, 70% of the population is going to die from chronic disease. And so if our population were like any others, what that means is that we'd have an exposure of four of about 2.8 million people that were going to die from, from uh, that growing list of cancers that we, mm -hmm. that we believe come from metabolic syndrome. Um, those things we know do the diabetes, the stroke, the heart disease, the Alzheimer's. Um, 
they've gotten a pass on it. The the metrics that would suggest that those things are in your future, um, HDL, triglyceride, glycated hemoglobin, um, uh, uh, blood pressure, mm -hmm. the elements of body comp. For every CrossFitter, whether you're coming one day a week or, or five, um, those things are moving in the right direction, which means that you are sneaking out the door mm -hmm. from chronic disease. Sure. And that may easily be 2.8 million saved lives right. in the current community. You know, they're still going to die, but not, but not prematurely and needlessly. Mm -hmm. And and that awareness is, uh, you know, that's something we need, something we need to share. Yeah, and it, cool. and it's and it's that it's those 2.8 million lives that you have to, you have to weigh the ACL tears, and the sprains and the strains. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, you know. It's a little weird to be sitting in the orthopedic surgeon's office with your badass studly injury you got from your sport and to see some fat dude who got the same thing getting out of his pickup truck. Right. You know, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> fell out of bed in the morning and you're yeah. and you're gonna be in the same hospital room, you <laughs> exactly, know. Like, exactly. Um everybody gets hurt. Yeah, yeah. Everybody gets hurt. That being said, um, we are dramatically safer than that uh jumping jack push up, uh sit up run lather rinse repeat pt that was going on in, in everywhere especially in, in like military and law mm -hmm. enforcement training you know in schools and we know this because we are the in-house fitness program for you know um maybe a hundred uh uh military and law enforcement training programs yeah we've been at colorado state patrol for now like 15 years 16 years wow and we know the injury rates. And let me tell you what I tell them about their injury rates. I look at it and I go, you, you need to get more people hurt. Hmm. You do. Um, they, it's too low. Too safe. It's too low. Yeah, make them fitter. Yeah. When I strive to to bring the injury down to zero, um, I, I'm pulling the plug on the, on the on the efficacy. Yeah. And you need some tolerance, you know. I, yeah, I asked the gym, you were a gymnast? Yes. Oh, did you ever get hurt? Never. I'm like, okay. You know, I know what kind of gymnast you were. Right, right. Yeah, you know, your mom took you five times kind of gymnast. Mm -hmm. You can't be, you can't stay in that sport without injury. It's true of football too. Yeah. There's no uninjured. Many, many injured seasons. Yeah. Yeah. You play through it too. They play injured. Yeah. I used to see the, all the greats from the Raiders at, over at, at, at Golds. And I remember... I remember seeing Todd Christensen with a bruise from <laughs> ribs to knee on, like, you know, and it would be like, it would just be this horrible thing that would expand and then mm. contract in the space of a week and getting ready for the next week. It's crazy. Yeah, it was just amazing. Hmm. What is something that you're most grateful for recently in your life? Oh, my babies, you know. I got I got seven kids and seven kids yeah wow. and they're just amazing and I that's the easy answer now because I'm oh, I'm a uh, two weeks away from them right now you know and I'm and I'm gonna go see them tonight or tomorrow depending on my wow. energy levels for the drive our planes down so I'm I'm driving it and uh, I just the, the little ones are are amazing mm. you get such insights into into the world and humanity and yes. seeing how an empty little head fills and. I, Crazy. Yeah, I love that. My little one said, uh, of course they're dangerous. That's why they call them murder cycles. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I mean, that's just rich, right? Right. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Um, this is a question I ask all my guests at the end. It's called the three truths question. So if this was the uh, the last day for you many, many years from now, and you've achieved everything you wanted to achieve, and you got to write down on a piece of paper three things you know to be true about all of your experience in life that you would pass on three lessons to your friends, your family, the world. What would those three And Lewis would give me 20 seconds to think of them. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Off the spot. As Off the, the plane's cover. going down. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Here's a pencil and paper. Uh, just kind of first, first thing that comes to you. It doesn't have to be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, check the ego, be honest. And, uh, yeah, I can, I can, I can give it to you. This, this isn't going to be, this is going to be succinct, but but it is is an important lesson, and it applies to I think everything we do. Um, I I routinely come across someone who's extended themselves for someone's, and it backfired. Um, 
it was either you know someone took advantage or wouldn't take advantage but you yeah. my god look what i did for you and then look what you did for it and i'm all bent out of shape you know and uh I've come to see that the that the spirit of the charity has to be has to be that it, it's up to them and and you can't in, invest of yourself so much that you're disappointed in the give if it doesn't come out right. Mm-hmm. And it's not a truly charitable thing if it's if it's not just that honest that uh I don't know what you're going to do with this and I, and I got my hopes but I, but I don't want to I don't want to be uh let's say disappointed if it doesn't work out because I don't want that to discourage me from, you know, you don't ever want the lesson to your chair to be that I'm never going to do that again for anybody. Right. Right. Of course. You know? And so you have to, you have to get, you have to be willing to get burned and, and repeatedly mm. to find that special person. And it's probably true in love employees. And I'm not wrecking your cord. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a, uh, I think that's really important. I think it's really important because I see I see that a lot in people. There, uh, in the training floor, it was uh, I had to be very careful. Maybe it was my problem, but I had to be careful that things got weird when I wanted more for people than they wanted for themselves. Mm. And it and it stresses relationships. Yeah. And so as a trainer, I was always kind of try to figure out what you want and what you're how what what you're really willing to give. And I needed to be close to that. I'd like to be a little bit in front of you, maybe. But I didn't want to be like, you're not living up to your potential. Right, 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 right. Damn right, it. Right. You know, that, that doesn't, it doesn't work for anybody. Yeah, yeah. And that is, believe it or not, for me somehow in my head related to that giving and being willing to, to see it not come out ideally and don't take the lesson from it to not give again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um, how can we support you? What's, uh, what's the main thing you want people to take action on and – try look um, at yeah i'll tell you i'll tell you something that's dear to us right now uh i've got a i got a gripe with the with the soda people mm-hmm. and it's three-pronged uh the first is the stuff's toxic but you know what so is meth <laughs> so is alcohol i mean there's a lot of toxic things in the world that that don't support health but i don't see them um having had a a uh uh corrupting influence on the health sciences and soda has mm. their their uh impact at at nih and at cdc and usda and fda and the american college of sports medicine and the national strength conditioning association it's been it's been it's been a national shame and a tragedy of unprecedented proportion that we've exported mm. so i've got the toxicity the corruption of the sciences and then the third um these people have stood up some uh, 501c3s and proxies that have um, lobbied and and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, legislated against our affiliates, mm. and that's the unforgivable one. Um, you know, it was always poison, and I always suspected the corruption, but we weren't bothered by it because we were doing our own thing. And here's how I deal with soda. Meat and vegetables, nuts and seeds, some fruit, little starch, and no sugar, and it's done. And I got 4 million people that don't drink the shit. But to find that I've got 22 pieces of legislation in eight states over nine years with my training in its crosshairs, when I find that Coca-Cola has spent a fortune to be the leading player in the chronic disease space and the training of trainers to fight this co- this chronic disease to make sure that it's known that you never talk about food um something's got to change and so and now it's a war now it's a war so it's those it's those three things the toxicity the corruption of the health sciences and then trying to stop us from just doing our own thing I mean, we weren't bothering anybody right you know the, the my my affront to soda pop was the was the new gym that opens every two hours and 24 minutes somewhere around the world is going to have two or 300 members that won't drink their shit eventually. That's all we were doing. Um, I didn't try to make what they do illegal and, and they did and they're denying it too. But, uh, we went to, uh, the Podesta group and, uh, one of the, it's like my favorite lobbying firm on earth. We went to them and retain them to help us find out just where this stuff had come from, 
one of these licensure bills actually passed in D.C. and we, we were getting it repealed, mm. which is a which is a, a miracle. I mean, it was a page two Wall Street Journal story that uh, CrossFit was the this is only the eighth time in forty years that a piece of occupational licensure had been repealed, and two of the times that's happened, it got put back. But uh, um, uh, we we hired them to help us figure out where this came from. Yeah. And the language was big chunks of the language identical. And so there's a, there's a fingerprint on this. Mm -hmm. Who wrote it, who sponsored it, and why? And uh, it's traced back to organizations that have no visible means of support outside of, right. outside of soda. Wow. And so that's, that's a... What can we help do to support? Well, you know, the awareness is everything. Yeah. Awareness is everything. Sure. And so I, you know... Don't drink pop. That's how we can support. You know, I, you know it's... It, look... That's already handled in our. We yes. have our consumptive reduction program. None of us are reading, so we, that's that's not the goal. I want to drive them out of the health sciences so that wow. I get them out of the fitness space. Sure. And at first, I just want them out of the fitness space, but I realized that the, that the fix was in it on with the docs, and we, we'll never find freedom if they're sold. If mm. They've been if they've sure, been paid sure, off. Sure. You know, if they've been silenced. Gotcha. And so I, I'm going to have to fix medicine to fix <coughs> fitness. Okay. And we definitely have a problem. Our crew, my Russ Green. Found that the head of uh, 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 nutrition, preventative nutrition research, or some damn thing, at the National C Cancer Institute, sat on uh, a big soda's payroll at the uh, at the uh, uh, International Life Sciences Institute. Sounds good, right? Mm. It's a bunch of soda heads collecting soda salaries to uh, to corrupt science. Mm. But you can imagine he did this until his death. And uh, can you imagine being in charge of of, of of uh, nutrition <coughs> research at the National Cancer Institute while taking a, a check from Coca-Cola. Mm. And what you'd expect to come of that is, is these these organizations would be incapable of pointing to sugar as a culprit in the diet. Guess what? They're in it. They've been un unable to do that. Mm. So I go to the CDC's website, and what do I see? What do they want to do to avoid chronic disease? Oh, reduce saturated fat and salt intake. Let me share something with you. You know the 2.8 million people are going to die? That wouldn't have saved a one of them. Mm. Not a one of them. Yeah. Yeah, you want to have a profound impact on someone's life? Take their sugar away. Absolutely. Thank you for this. Yeah, you're welcome. You've been a, welcome. you've been a, you've been a great interviewer. Yeah, I've got I've got one final question for you. Yes, sir. And before I uh, I ask, I want to take a moment to acknowledge you for your incredible drive and for being a catalyst for saving so many people's lives and transforming health in so many people. It's unbelievable to see what you've built. And what the community has built with you. Thank you. And how people have rallied behind this idea of eating better and moving functionally. And um, you've been leading the charge. So I want to acknowledge I, Greg for I that. I warmly appreciate that. But, yeah. I just, but I have to let you know I'm, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable. Just part humility and, and part just honesty. Um, I got I got a lot of people that put a lot of energy in t into mm -hmm. what I'm doing have done. Um and going back to to my first partner um Lauren Glassman to all the people that support me today and including a whole coterie of folks that worked for free for years yeah. before there was a job worked for free for years before mm -hmm. there was a job mm -hmm. and uh y y once that happens it's it's hard to t it's hard to me or i anything it's we sure, sure, you sure. know we did this right well i appreciate you being the catalyst uh, thank to inspire you. People to I tell people I, I threw a lit cigarette out the window and it started a forest fire. You know, <laughs> there you go. I, you say, I'm not, I'm not the god go. of the sun. Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, final question for you. Yes, sir. What's your definition of greatness? My definition of greatness. I don't know. I don't have one. It's weak, but. Nothing coming to mind. You know, you know what's interesting? Like, greatness is one of those things. It's like it's like endpoint. You know, and and I'm a process guy, and I and I, I'm, I'm not so much about achievement as I'm about process. And you mm. stay committed to process, and that's where achievement comes from. But we, we, uh, there are things that we we set out to do, and and. I don't have a sense of whether it's going to take 18 months or 50 years, and I don't care either because it's we're going to do the right thing yeah. for the right people for the right reason. It's always it's always paid off sooner than I would have thought, but I was I never started with that in mind. Yeah, it's kind of like and I use the example of a fight too. Um, I, I I've been in I've been in a lot of fights 
of all sorts, but I've never, I've never, I've never picked one because I was sure I'd win it. It was like it was just it's time to do this, you know. Mm, sure, sure. So this 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 person or concept needs their ass beat. Sure, sure. And uh, it may not work, but it's it's it, right. it's needed, and I'm a, I'm gonna give it a whirl. You know, hold my beer, watch this. Sure. I don't have I don't have it's a definition good. of greatness. It's okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you very it. much. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Thanks so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. And if you enjoyed this video, then make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can do that by clicking right here to subscribe because each week we come out with awesome, epic, and inspiring interviews and messages and videos just for you. So click subscribe right here to get notified of new videos every week. Also, if you enjoyed this specific interview, we've got a lot of great interviews like this that are uplifting and inspiring. So click right here to watch the previous interviews because the people I've had on are pretty cool and epic as well. So click here to watch previous interviews. Click here to subscribe. I love you guys, and I'll see you very soon.